Good morning. I'm Professor Barbara Sahakian, and I'm based at the University of Cambridge Department of Psychiatry. And today I'm going to discuss good brain health and well being for everybody. Now, the aims of the talk are to promote good brain health. And I want to make the point that brain health is every bit as important as physical health. I also want to emphasize that we need early detection and early effective treatment of mental health disorders. And that will be key to improving recovery and long-term outcome. So it's the same for physical health. You have to detect things early and treat them early. And then I want to emphasize the importance of good cognition, resilience, and well-being throughout our whole life course. Then I'm going to discuss how technology can help us measure and improve our cognition and motivation. And finally, to discuss evidence-based ways to mental well-being. Now, this is from the UK government foresight project on mental capital and well-being. And it talks about enhancing our cognition, resilience, and well-being over the whole life course. And importantly, it emphasizes that cognition, emotional resources, and resilience in the face of stress are so important for us. And here you can see in blue, pointing upward, the factors that actually improve our cognition and our well being, and that's such things as a good education and good social support systems. And you can see in red, pointing downwards, the negative things that detract from our good cognition and detract from well being. And those are things such as stress and drug and alcohol abuse. Now from that a project, we found five evidence-based ways to mental well-being. And one of them is exercise, and exercise is so good for you. It's good for your mood, it's good for your cognition, and it's good for your physical health. So it's a kind of all-rounder. If you do exercise, you get a lot of benefit from it. And then there's also keep learning. So we need to keep learning throughout our whole life course. That's very important. And learning actually stimulates new brain cells. And then we have mindfulness or take notice. And mindfulness is very good treatment, both for anxiety and depression. And when we take walks, we should really focus on the beauty around us, focus on different interesting features, reflect on your experiences, and really get in the moment, that's important for you. And then connect. We need to connect with people around us. We need to have good support systems in our friends and our colleagues and our neighbors. And that will help us in times of stress if we have friends that we can go to. And also, it will help make sure that we're not socially isolated or lonely. And then we have giving or volunteering. And actually, when you give or volunteer, it stimulates an, uh, a neural network in the brain that is our reward system. So it's very important to engage in those activities because you actually get a lot of reward from it. And also, it activates our sort of social attachment areas in the brain. So these are some possible methods of boosting your brain power. And the first one is pharmacological, smart drugs, or cognitive enhancing drugs. And then there's also neuroprosthetics for cognition. As I mentioned, education and lifelong learning are so important. And you can see here the evidence that learning actually helps to generate new brain cells in important areas such as the hippocampus, which we know is important for learning and memory. And then physical exercise, as I mentioned, is so important and cognitive training or brain training apps. And this shows us that exercise is strongly associated with improving cognition in school children. So the more they exercise, the better they are reading achievement and also mathematics. And at the other age, uh, end of the age spectrum, we can see that with exercise, you get a cognitive improvement you get less cognitive decline, and actually you live longer too. So exercise is really wonderful. 
Now, I wrote this paper with Martin Norell some years ago on use it or lose it for the British Medical Journal. And that really emphasized that you have to keep your mind active throughout your life course and really exercise your mind in the same way that you exercise your body. So keep it active. Do things that really stretch your mind and, uh, you know, new learning and education, very important. And here we can see also from the work of Torkel Klingberg that 14 hours of uh, cognitive training over five weeks was associated with an increased brain activity on a working memory task. And you can see the areas such as the prefrontal cortex and parietal cortex, which are activated when we perform a working memory task, are actually increased in their activation with this training. And there's also changes in the dopamine receptor D1 binding potential in the same areas. And then we also have evidence from Eleanor McGuire and her colleagues, which shows that with increased learning and remembering of locations in, in London by taxi drivers, you actually get an increase in the size of the posterior hippocampus. Now we have objective methods of measuring components of cognition, and I'm co-inventor of the CANTAB tests. So I use these tests, which uh, are computerized and run on a touch sensitive screen, or indeed on iPads. And they measure different domains of cognitive functions, such as attention and concentration, working memory, different forms of executive function, including cognitive control and cognitive flexibility, and very important, episodic memory and learning. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the problems that people with schizophrenia have. And people with schizophrenia have three kinds of problems. They have the psychotic symptoms, such as delusions and hallucinations, what we call the florid symptoms that many people are familiar with, such as hearing voices. But these are reasonably well treated with antipsychotic medication. However, there are still two unmet needs. And one of the most important ones is the impairment in cognitive function. And they are the biggest barrier to rehabilitation. And that's one reason why when young people might be diagnosed as having schizophrenia when they're at university, they often uh, drop out and can't go back to university because of the cognitive problems that they're experiencing. And because these cognitive problems are the biggest barrier to rehabilitation, the regulatory body, the FDA, has recognized them as a target for treatment. But as yet, we have no medications that are available to treat these symptoms. <laughs> and then we also have motivational deficits. And these problems in motivation, or negative symptoms as they call, can also significantly hinder rehabilitation and they need to be effectively treated too. Well, what is episodic memory? Episodic memory, and the one reason I focus on it, is it's such an important kind of everyday memory. We use it all the time, every day. So for instance, if you go into a multi-story car park and you park your car somewhere, and then after several hours, you're at work or say you're shopping, you come back, you have to remember where you parked your car in this car park. Or suppose you're just about to leave the house and you have to remember where did I leave my keys or remember where you left your mobile phone. So we're using it all the time. And, and this kind of episodic memory is very, very much associated with our everyday functioning. And you can understand why. Now, what we found is that when we uh, measure this kind of episodic memory and learning in people with first episode psychosis, which is often the early stages of schizophrenia, we found that it was impaired in these people. And importantly, this impairment in episodic memory was related to their functioning in everyday life, to their GAF scores, which is the global assessment of function. So again, it's very important to be able to improve this kind of memory because we might be able to improve people's functioning in their daily life. And what we try to do to improve uh, episodic memory and learning in these uh, patients with schizophrenia was develop a form, a gamified form of cognitive training. Now we know that cognitive training is successful in improving cognition in patients with schizophrenia, 
but they often have to do it within a hospital setting. And sometimes it can be very boring because they're doing something rather repetitive on a computer and they don't really enjoy it very much. So often there's a, a lot of dropouts. As many as 40% of patients may actually drop out before the training is finished. So we thought, well, why don't we just turn it into a game so that they can really enjoy doing it? And it also um, takes away the stigma and normalizes the type of activity. So we based our episodic memory and learning game on our neuropsychological and neuroimaging evidence. And we worked together for several months, psychologists, neuroscientists, a professional games developer, uh, Tom Piercy, and the service users, people with schizophrenia, because we wanted the game to be fun, attention grabbing, motivating, and easy to understand. And we also titrated the game in difficulty so that when um, pe people were doing well, the game got more challenging. But if they started to have trouble, uh, it came down and got easier. So we have uh, two of these episodic memory and learning games, one for older people, people with mild cognitive impairment, memory problems, and that's called Game Show. And then the wizard for younger people and people with schizophrenia. And the wizard game is based on a Harry Potter motif. And what happens is you have to remember where runes go and different chests. And if you can do that successfully, you move ahead and you, you get different spells that you can cast. And that helps you to defeat the other wizard. And then you can move to the next level. So if you can't remember them immediately, you can learn where they go. And it, it's great fun as I'll be showing you. So I'll show you what wizard looks like now. So you can see that that's great fun. And when we take this uh, wizard game to different uh, science festivals, children, adults, everybody loves to play it. Adolescents absolutely adore it. And you can see here that the patients with schizophrenia enjoyed playing it and wanted to continue playing it um, throughout the eight hours that they had. So they had training for eight hours over one month. And you can also see that um, they had a better performance in terms of their learning and memory and they also had better functioning in their day-to-day -day life. So it really was beneficial for them. And we were able to technology transfer this uh, game to PEAK 
And the nice thing there is they uh, moved it from the iPad onto mobile phones so anybody could use it all around the world. And um, it also makes it readily accessible to anybody who would like to improve their learning and memory. And as a laboratory, we can't do that sort of thing because it's too difficult uh, to spend resources on it. So it was wonderful to be able to uh, tech transfer this and get it out there to everybody so they could improve their learning and memory. Now I'm going to talk about another game, Dakota, and Dakota runs on an iPad, and it, as I'll be showing you, it improves attention and concentration in healthy young people. And as you will have experienced yourself, when you're trying to work or study, um, you increasingly have to rely on technologies. But often these um, interfere with what you're trying to do because you're switching your attention from emails to te text to other tasks. So when you're trying to complete a big job for say work or school, you're often getting distracted. And so we wanted to help people to be able to focus their attention so they could do these big jobs. So we wanted them to be able to focus their attention, concentrate, get into the flow, stay in the flow, and therefore they could obtain their big goals that they were trying to do and they could complete the tasks. Now, as well as this being uh, very useful for healthy young people, of course, there are groups that have problems of attention and concentration. And there's people with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or traumatic brain injury. And so Dakota may also improve attention and concentration in these groups. So uh, I'll be showing you Dakota, and, and it's got a very different kind of uh, story to it, storyline to it. So basically what happens is it's more like a James Bond thing. And what you have to do is detect sequences of numbers and they're coming at you quite rapidly and you detect these sequences of numbers. And when you're correct, you get more information and then you're able to uh, break up gangs of people around the world using the information that you've obtained by actually sustaining your attention, detecting these sequences, getting information, and moving on to bust up these gangs. So I'll now show you Dakota. can see in, in these data are that people, uh, young healthy people, really do improve their attention and concentration by playing this game for eight hours over one month. And that's a, a big difference compared to controls who don't play anything at all, and also a big difference compared to people who are just playing bingo. So uh, Dakota will be very useful for healthy young people to keep their attention focused, but also it may be uh, very useful for people with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and traumatic brain injury. So the last area I'll be talking about is autism spectrum disorder. And we've been working with children who are very young because that's when social development starts and you have to get in there early and detect problems early. And so that way you can make sure you treat and they have a good uh, social communication throughout the rest of their lives. Now, autism is uh, fairly prevalent, and there's more males than females that have it, and it's characterized by impairments in social communication, restricted interests, and repetitive behavior. And we've really focused on the social communication. We've been training eye gaze between the child and the parent, 
and also a reciprocal play. And I'm going to show you now a video of uh, autism uh, spectrum disorder game, which is called AI Monkey King. And um, this video uh, has my colleague in it, you are you, and his daughters, and she's typically developing. So the children love this game, and the game was a collaboration between Xinhua Hospital, Shanghai Zhao Tong University School of Medicine, and the Fudan University. And so in conclusion, while many people monitor and improve their physical health using mobile devices and wearable technology, they rarely consider improving and monitoring their brain health. Technology, as I've shown you, including apps on an iPad and mobile phones, can be used for treatments, including cognitive training or brain training. And brain training games improve motivation. And finally, education in schools on brain health, resilience, and well-being should form part of the curriculum. And this would ensure that everyone can achieve good brain health and well-being throughout their lives. I finally want to thank Mr. Tom Piercy, the games developer in our laboratory, and two of the postdoctoral researchers who work there, Dr. Christelle Langley and Dr. George Savilage. Thank you for listening.